Well, I hope that I've sufficiently emphasized what, what I'm not going to say this morning, and I wanted to do that just in case there was any misunderstanding of what it is that, that I am saying or what it is that we believe Jesus is saying or what, of course, Jesus is actually telling us here. Not that we're working our way to heaven, but that his grace within us will move us to change, move us to strive, move us to move forward, will change us into the image of our Lord Jesus. Let me begin by reading the passage. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 22. I think I had put 23 in the bulletin, divided it. Um, okay, uh, we are going to deal with verse 22 as well. So, beginning in verse 22, Luke writes this. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, uh, and, yeah, he will say I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding and to our growth in, in grace this morning. We uh, see Jesus now continuing uh, towards Jerusalem, where, as we know, he's going to lay down his life to save his people, where he's going to lay down his life to save us, if we are trusting in him this morning. And the first thing we should notice is that our Lord Jesus Christ was not idle along the way. That's one thing that, that, pass, or that stands out about Jesus. He didn't waste time. So as he's passing from one city and village to another, he continues to teach the people. And by the way, we should notice this, that the Jews were not the enemies of our Lord, at least in a certain sense. We need to remember the Jews were actually the Lord's people, right? These were His people that He was teaching. John tells us in the opening of His gospel in verse 11, He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive Him. You know, collectively speaking, the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to see a little bit more about that as we progress through the sermon. But even though they were unfaithful, Jesus always remained faithful to them. As their good shepherd, he was still concerned for their well-being. And so he continued to point them in the right direction. You know, faithfulness is one of the many virtues that our Lord possesses. And it's one of the virtues that the Spirit of God puts within our hearts when he saves us. He works to make us more like Jesus. He gives us this Christ-like commitment that doesn't turn aside from doing what is right under any circumstances. A faithfulness like that of Athanasius. I, I like to continue to bring up Athanasius because he really is a hero of the faith. When the entire uh, world essentially turned against the doctrine of the Trinity and even within the church, Athanasius stood his ground, and he was not willing to compromise on that, even though it meant he would lose his position. Uh, he was exiled from his bishopric and from his, his, his country five times in, in, in his lifetime. And then finally, of course, uh, his position uh, you know, won the day. But he would rather stand against the world than compromise and dishonor his Lord. Now, that is the virtue that our Lord works in us by His Holy Spirit, certainly the virtue that we see in our Lord Jesus Christ, faithfulness. Faithfulness also in using our time and our opportunities to its best advantage to glorify God, which is what our Lord Jesus Christ was doing as He was on His way to glorify His Father in Jerusalem. Everything He did was aimed at that. And that's really our pattern. That's our model. That's what we need to be doing. And it's really simply another way of saying, We'd strive, okay? Uh, 
Now, as he was traveling, someone asked him this question. Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Now, if, if we were traveling with Jesus and we had the opportunity to ask him a question, you know, what would we ask him? You know, what is it that we're most concerned about? You know, think about it for a minute. Would our question be theological? You know, a lot of us like to study theology, right? Um, Lord, tell us about the Trinity. How is it that, that God is one and yet there are three persons in, in the Godhead? Or tell me about your nature, uh, your two natures, Jesus. How can you be God and man at the same time? Or, Jesus, when are you coming back? You know, when is the second coming? And what's the kingdom going to look like when you actually do return? Is it going to be worldwide? Or is it going to be basically a struggle and perhaps uh, looks like the kingdom might be almost extinguished? What's it going to look like? Is that the kind of question that we would ask him? Or would we ask him a more practical question, uh, such as the one this person asks, one that deals with salvation? Well, that's exactly what he did because that was most important to him. He asked Jesus how many would be saved but I think what he really wanted to, to know was, Jesus, am I going to be saved? Now, this morning, let's look at three things from this passage. First of all, this man's concern regarding salvation, his salvation and the salvation of the Jews. Secondly, Jesus urging him to strive into the kingdom, to enter the kingdom of heaven and what that means. And then thirdly, Jesus' warning about failing to enter the kingdom because of the very real possibility for those who are on the outside. Now, first of all, let's consider this man's concern for his salvation. I think it's safe to say that as he was listening to Jesus in this crowd, he apparently got the impression that only a few people were going to be saved. Uh, that's what his question certainly implies, isn't it? And I think he should have asked this question because that's really what Jesus was teaching. We saw a very good example of it uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Jesus had been teaching that the requirements that God holds for those who will enter into heaven are very high. And uh, the reason he said that, of course, is to get them to, or really to drive them to himself. For instance, he had just told the Jews that if they didn't settle their accounts with God while they were on their way to stand before him on the day of judgment, the great judge was going to throw them into the fiery prison and they would never come out. Uh, he just warned them that the Galileans that were killed by Pilate while they were offering their sacrifices at the Passover, and the 18 who were killed in Siloam by the tower, really had nothing on the Jews that he was speaking to, because if they didn't repent, they also would perish. Now, this principle of, again, um, obedience, this, this idea that we're evil, we need to repent, that no one is really good enough to enter into the kingdom is certainly shot through everything that Jesus said. We just read earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's not those who call Jesus Lord, but it's those who obey him. Jesus said something even perhaps more startling early on in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, verse 20, where he says to a people who believe that the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees were the, the, the ultimate uh, as far as pious and righteous people, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And John the Baptist preached the same thing, didn't he? As he goes out before Jesus and says this, indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees so every tree that does not bear f good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, for sayings like this and many others, this man was particularly concerned. And he was concerned, I think, because of what he had been taught before he began to listen to Jesus, what he was taught by the Jews, by the Jewish leaders. And what were they taught regarding entering the kingdom of heaven? That all of Abraham's physical children as well as those who proselytized or converted to the Christian faith, all who were circumcised were actually going to enter that kingdom. They were going to be saved. Do you realize that Jesus and John throughout, well, John, of course, his ministry was rather brief, but Jesus also throughout his ministry was preaching against that 
particular idea. John preached this in, um, well, again, following up the text we looked at earlier in, in Luke 3, verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Oops, being a child of Abraham isn't enough. The fact that I'm his physical offspring is not going to save me. My circumcision is not going to save me. And if we put this in the context today, baptism isn't going to save me. Church membership isn't going to save me. You know, these sometimes uh, as we minister to people and talk about baptism and circumcision, sometimes you get the impression in the Bible, as this man had the impression, that these things really do save you. But we need to remember they don't. We have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is going to tell us, strive to enter into the kingdom. These are really just pictures of the work God does in order to save us. It's the Holy Spirit's work in the heart that produces faith and repentance. And that is what Jesus came to bring. Now, Jesus doesn't say it here, but he does say it in the Sermon on the Mount, as I've already pointed out. Uh, he doesn't answer the man's question, but he does there. Are there only a few who are being saved? What is the answer? Yes, there's only a few. But I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't answer his question in that way here. Uh, he tells him, rather, what he needs to do to enter into that kingdom, rather than how many are actually going to be saved. He answers the more important question. How can you be saved? You know, being related to Abraham, circumcision isn't enough. What do you need? This is what he tells him. And it's interesting because what he's doing here is preaching the gospel to him in a way that we don't often hear it. Strive to enter through the narrow door. And let me just make a note here that Jesus isn't just talking to this man now, but he says to the crowd, he says to all of them, that's a good question. Let me tell all of you how you are to be saved. You need to strive through the, enter door, the uh, narrow door. Now, the question is, what does Jesus mean? Well, we know what the narrow door is. We know who the narrow door is. And, of course, that's the Lord himself. He is the door into the kingdom. He said to the Jews in John 10, verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And then, of course, he says also to Thomas in the upper room discourse in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the door. So if you would be saved, you must first of all come to Jesus. Now, that part we understand. It's the striving part that, that we are perhaps a bit unfamiliar with. What does he mean by striving to enter by him? Because as we usually hear it, isn't salvation, and really be, be, to be more technical, justification being just in the sight of God, which is that from which salvation flows, isn't that simply a matter of believing and trusting? We're saved by grace alone through faith alone. We are justified by grace alone through faith alone. Where's the striving in that? And doesn't Jesus say this in John 3.16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Paul says of, of Abraham in Romans 4 verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, those things are all true. Of course they're all true. Uh, we know that. We know that that's how we're saved. But there is something else here that Jesus doesn't want this man to overlook something that has to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, something the Spirit creates within the heart, something that will be true of everyone who has true, genuine, saving faith of all who will enter into the kingdom of heaven, and that is that they will strive to enter. Really, in two different senses. They will strive to come to Jesus, and they will strive once they've come to Jesus until the day they actually enter into heaven itself. Okay? They will strive. Now, the question is, what does that mean? Well, the word in the Greek is, you've probably heard this before, agonizomai, and that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Because that's where our English word agonize comes from. The word means to struggle, 
or to fight or to make every effort or to try very hard. Okay? This is what we must do to enter through the door to come to Jesus and to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, God's grace creates the faith that justifies, uh, that enables us to strive to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, here's an additional element that isn't always apparent. But it also produces a desire to be sanctified, to overcome all obstacles, and to become like our Lord Jesus. Now, let me just say that what Jesus is saying here is really no different than what the Reformers were saying. Another way of putting this is this. We are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. Think about James. James says in James 2, verse 26, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Faith is active. Faith will overcome obstacles, any obstacle that gets in the way between you and Christ and then between you and the kingdom of heaven. It breaks through all the opposition. What Jesus was telling these, this crowd was essentially this, that to enter the kingdom, they needed to overcome certain things. First of all, to come to Him, which is their natural aversion to Christ because we don't come into this world necessarily loving Jesus. I mean, just take the Jews as a test group of what the world thinks of Jesus. What did they do with Him? They turned Him over to Pilate, cried out for His blood, nailed Him to a cross, and we're happy to accept the guilt of his destruction. Okay, that is what the world thinks of Jesus. They have to overcome this natural aversion to him. They have to overcome their love for their sins. They have to overcome their fear of the Jewish leaders. They have to overcome their fear of what they might have to give up, what they might lose if they follow Jesus, such as their family or their possessions and even their own lives. Those are the obstacles of just coming to Jesus. Remember how Jesus says, count the cost and don't come to me unless you're willing to pay that price. But how can you be willing to pay that price? That's part of the striving that the Spirit of God works in us that drives us to Jesus. And, of course, there's, there's more that you have to strive from earth to heaven. It is a lifelong struggle against the various things that get in our way of becoming more and more like Jesus and doing his work. You know, there's more that we can learn from the, the word agonizomai in the, in the original text here. Uh, it's, it's a command, and it's in the present tense, and uh, in, the, in the Greek language, the present tense really reflects more not just upon the present time, but upon the action that's involved, and the present tense often means continual action. This is something you must continually do. So you need to begin, and you need to continue to do this until you actually come to Jesus and until you actually enter fully into the kingdom of heaven at the end of your life. Now, this is what's wrapped up in what Jesus is saying here, where they have to strive to enter through that narrow door. Now, finally, let's take a look at the warning that Jesus gives. Actually, a couple different warnings not to fail. Now, his first warning is this, and this is perhaps the most uh, fearful one. Many will try, but few will actually succeed. He says in verse 24, For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Now, what does he mean? Many will fail because they're not going to be able to overcome the things that are standing in their way of Jesus, first of all, in coming to him. Their distaste of Jesus because their hearts are still in rebellion against him. Their love for their sins, they're not going to be able to let go. Their fear of the Jewish leaders and of what they might lose if they follow him. Isn't that what the author to the Hebrews was warning the Hebrews about? You know, that, that um, you went through so much suffering and now you're in danger of your lives, but you can't turn away from Christ to save your lives. So don't be afraid of what you might lose. Now, again, the question is, who can really do this? I mean, who can strive in this way and actually enter into Jesus or enter, you know, by trusting in Jesus? Well, the answer is, again, it's too difficult for anyone to do in their own strength, isn't it? We can't do that. Uh, the account we're going to read later, when Jesus tells his disciples that it would be easier for a camel, a full-size camel, to go through 
the eye of a needle, and not, not a gate in Jerusalem, but a literal eye of a needle, uh, that it would be easier for the camel to do that than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven when in the disciples' mind, the rich man is the one most likely to enter into the kingdom of heaven because he can spend all of his time striving to enter. He can spend all of his time cultivating basically his, his walk with the Lord and, and doing good things for the Lord. Their response to what Jesus said there was this, then who can be saved? I mean, they were despairing. We're not going to make it then. But Jesus will say this, the things that are impossible with people are possible with God. Okay? God is the one who has to do this work in you, and if he does it, you will do it. You will enter. No one can enter the kingdom in their own strength is what Jesus is saying here. Many are going to try, but they're going to fail. What Jesus is doing is pointing them to him, to his grace, because he's the only one who can give the Spirit of God, who actually gives the power to strive in this way, who gives that desire. Many are going to fail because they're going to fail to come to Jesus. But then Jesus goes on to give them another reason why they might fail. It's because they're not going to do it in time, okay? They're not going to take up this charge and go. Uh, listen to what Jesus says in, in chapter 13, verses 25 through 30. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. Now, what, what is Jesus saying here? What he's saying is you need to come now because if you continue to resist the Holy Spirit, the door of opportunity is eventually going to close. Now, it could close in, in many different ways. 70 AD he closed it on a number of people, didn't it? It could close because they resist and grieve the Spirit to the point where God gives them over. The author to the Hebrews talks about that in Hebrews 6. Which we call it the unpardonable sin. Or they might just run out of time. Life. I mean, life comes to an end. But once that happened, it's not going to matter. What they knew about Jesus, what they had done with Jesus, whether they had eaten with Jesus. Remember, Jesus was invited to many different dinner parties, and he came and he spoke the truth. Jesus preached in many different streets, and if they heard him, and they knew what he said. That's not going to make any difference because they didn't act on it. They didn't come to him. They didn't trust him. All that is going to matter in that day is that they did not enter while they could enter. And now, again, as a part of his warning, not having entered, they're going to be cast into the outer darkness. This outer darkness is, is again, as you know, is hell. It's not some compartment outside of heaven. I don't know if you heard that, but that is obviously not what it's talking about. It's not a purgatory that you have to suffer before you get into heaven. This is talking about people who are excluded from the kingdom, a place that is dark, a place where there is suffering that is so bad that all they can do is weep and gnash their teeth, their teeth in pain because of the agony. And, you know, Jesus said it's going to make, be even worse for them because there, in that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth in that darkness, they are going to be able to see the kingdom of God. They're going to see the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to see the prophets in the kingdom of heaven. They're going to see the Gentiles, those whom he would call from the four corners of the earth, from the east and west and north and south. They're going to see them sitting down, celebrating in the kingdom of heaven knowing that Jesus had offered them these same things, but they turned them down. By the way, I said, this is one of a couple of passages that actually tells us something which is kind of interesting, and that is that heaven and hell can see each other. Um, and we could get into how that's going to affect heaven, how that's going to affect hell. It's certainly going to make things worse for the people in hell, especially when they know they could be in heaven, but they refuse the Lord Jesus Christ because they love their sins more. Uh, but as far as in those in heaven, it doesn't actually uh, 
ruin their bliss because they know as they look that they deserve to be there, but only by the grace of Christ they're not there. Okay, And they also know that God is just in punishing the wicked and he is glorified in their sufferings. But on this last point, remember the promises of the kingdom of heaven were made to the Jews. They were the ones who were first, but now they were going to take last place, right? And those who were formerly the last, those would be the Gentiles who were strangers to the covenants of God and aliens, you know, basically had no hope in the world. Those are the ones who receive Jesus and who become first. So Jesus is telling them essentially this, don't be shut out of the kingdom. That was promised to you. Do your best to enter while the door of mercy is still open. Jesus is saying, come to me. Break through any obstacle that is keeping you from coming to me right now and then keep on striving until you actually enter into the kingdom of God and that is what you will do if you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't, then Jesus is saying you need to come to me because he's the only one who actually can give you the Holy Spirit. Now, what, how can we apply this passage this morning? Okay, well, obviously it applies to us in the same way, right? If we would enter the kingdom of heaven, we need to strive. We need to do our best to enter that kingdom or we will not enter it at all. Now, again, let me remind you, justification, salvation, is by grace alone, through faith alone. That is absolutely true. If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we <clears throat> will be saved. But the faith that he gives is not alone. It's an act of faith. You know, there's that passage in John 3 where John the Baptist is speaking. He says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. How, why? Do you, do you know that in the Greek, the, the two words for believe and obey, they're the same, the word that we typically translate belief. So why did the translators interpret that as obey? Because it's an act of faith. It's a faith that acts upon what God says, not just trusting in Jesus, but following Jesus. The faith that he gives is not alone. It is always accompanied by striving. It's always accompanied by fighting, by racing, by running, by boxing, by doing everything necessary to grow in holiness, to grow into the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the salvation that, that he gives to us, the thing that he does in us that, that brings us all about is he simply gives us the Holy Spirit who gives us a holy love or a love for what is holy. And that love produces this striving. See, this is the gift of God that we would strive in this way. And that gift is the gift of love. It moves us first to trust in Jesus for our salvation and to turn from our sins and to put them to death and then, of course, to follow him, even if it means that we have to give up everything that we possess, family, friends, possessions, and even our own lives. This is the evidence the Spirit of God is in us, that we really know the Lord Jesus, that we really are trusting in the Lord Jesus when out of love for him we lay aside, as the author to the Hebrews said in our meditation, everything that encumbers us, everything that gets in our way, and the sin that so easily entangles us, that ties us up so that we can't run, and we begin to run that race with our eyes fastened upon Jesus. This is essentially what, um, again, the, uh, Paul means when he says that by the Spirit we are putting to death the deeds of the body. This is what Jesus means when he says that if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven and your eye stumbles, pluck it out. If you're hand offends you, cut it off. He doesn't mean literally, but he means cut off that sin, put it to death. This is what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no room for sin in our lives. That's what striving is, sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. And all we need to do this is the love that the Spirit gives. Let me just say, before I read this last quote, that it's still imperfect, doesn't mean we're going to do this perfectly, we're going to fail in many different ways, but we will be moving ahead, we will be growing if we belong to Jesus. Listen to what Thomas Watson writes about the power of, of love. The world knows about it, we know about it, and certainly the Lord does, which is why he gives us this love for the kingdom, for heaven. He writes this, 
Love puts a man upon the full use of all means to enjoy the thing that he loves. He that loves the world, how active is he? He will break his peace and sleep for it. He that loves honor, what hazards will he run? He will swim to the throne in blood. Love heaven, and you cannot miss it. Love breaks through all opposition. It takes heaven by storm. Where do you suppose that quote came from? Okay. Heaven Taken by Storm, the book that Thomas Watson wrote about striving to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's really a book about sanctification, becoming more like Jesus. If you have, if I have this love in us, then that's what we're doing. We are striving towards heaven. But if we find this morning we don't have it, then let me just counsel you to do what Jesus counseled all who are listening to him, and that is look to Jesus to give you the Holy Spirit, to give you his grace so that you can strive to enter into heaven. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Let's bow for just a moment of prayer and ask for his grace to apply what we've heard.